I now have the uh, immense uh, honor of uh, just introducing uh, my friend and colleague, uh, Reverend Michelle Sanchez, uh, who serves as the executive minister of Making Deep and Disciples for the Evangelical Covenant Church denomination, um, and is also the author of Color Courageous Discipleship, Follow Jesus, Dismantle Racism, and Build Beloved Community. Um, you see the table outside of the... Um, outside in the, in the foyer, uh, I highly encourage you to uh, take the opportunity to purchase a book. Uh, I have them all at home. She also has one for teens as well. Um, so it's, there's, there's something for every level of family. Um, her dream is to foster multi-ethnic movement of disciples who make disciples across all ages. Prior to this role, Michelle served as pastor of Christian formation and mission at High Rock Covenant Church in the Boston area. She has previously served in the leadership for the, how do you pronounce that, Lausanne, Lausanne Community for World Evang Evangelization, Evang I don't know why I can't read this morning, Evangelization, Launch Ministries to International Students with the Multi-Ethnic Crew Team, uh, which is Campus Crusade for Christ, they changed the name, um, and worked as an investment banker for Goldman Sachs and Company. Uh, Michelle has earned an MDiv and a THM from Gordon Conwell. So you got a, do you all have a mascot at Gordon Conwell? Got like a chant, you know what I'm saying? Like GC, woo, I don't know. All right, it's still more North Park folks in here, it's okay. Uh, <laughs> Uh, theological Seminary, an international business degree from New York University, um, and certification in spiritual direction from Boston College. Um, but just to say personally, I, I just had the honor of working with uh, Reverend Sanchez on a couple different projects, the Justice Journey. Uh, uh, she pulled me in to work on that. Uh, we were also on a team um, that was working on uh, training covenant pastors um, on posture shift, which was a curriculum to help churches and congregations lean into what it means to love God and love neighbor, but also love those who identify as LGBTQ, um, particularly as it pertains to what our denomination says, um, or denomination leans into as the biblical standard. Um, and so trying to help folks walk into the line of being loving, uh, but also honoring God's word. And so uh, that was also another initiative. So I've had the honor of sitting in her brilliance um, for several different uh, different occasions and different things. And so it was a, it's a blessing to have her here to share with us today. Um, and so before you come up, can we just all uh, point our head, hands toward Reverend Michelle and say, God bless. Reverend Michelle. God bless. Reverend Michelle. God bless. Reverend Michelle. The next speaking voice you hear will be that of Reverend Michelle Sanchez. I uh, pray that the Lord use you in a mighty way to bless our congregation and challenge us um, and encourage us and uh, help us grow in our faith and discipleship. Thank you. Thank you. Well, good morning, good morning. It is such a joy that I finally have an excuse to visit Naperville Covenant Church. I have been serving as the national leader for discipleship in the Covenant for a while. Headquarters, I think many of you know, is in Chicago. Uh, but I have not had the opportunity to, to visit Naperville. Um, also, I'll just say, uh, not only have I thoroughly enjoyed getting to know Leslie over the years, but also Brandy. Uh, we are colleagues at Covenant Offices and have hung out on a number of occasions. So it is delightful, delightful, delightful to be here. Oh, I see another friend in the audience. Hi. <laughs> we used to be colleagues at Covenant Office too, Ed and I. So yeah, there's a number of uh, familiar faces here, and it's just wonderful to, um, to be here. So today, uh, we're talking about courageous love. And did I hear something earlier about that's one of the things that you aspire to do here, is to love courageously? I think, I think somebody said that. So this is right in line. Uh, this whole, this whole uh, conversation is going to be right in line with that. And um, yes, so I, the big project, I've been involved with many things, but a huge project in the last couple of years for me uh, has been <coughs> Color Courageous Discipleship. And this is essentially a series of books that are essentially helping us understand what is Christ-centered discipleship around race look like. 
And what does it look like at all ages? Because we know it is so important to start these kinds of conversations early. And so um, before I dive into that and tell you a little bit about the story behind this project, I want to introduce my family to you. Now, it is very rare that the entire family can be with me. They are here today, over there, and, you know, a little embarrassed. <laughs> They're all here, so that's another reason. Uh, it's fun to be at Naperville today. Um, so uh, my, my family have been married to Mickey for 20 years. And uh, people, because I talk about race, I also like to clarify, well, what is my background? You know, last name is Sanchez, blah, you know. So that is from Mickey. Uh, Mickey is Colombian American. He was the last of five boys uh, and born, and the only one born in the United States, in New York. And so um, that's, that's where my last name comes from. But I myself am African American and Caribbean American. And uh, then my son Seth is uh, 13, and then my daughter Hope is having a birthday in just a couple weeks. This is so exciting. And she'll be 10. And uh, yeah, so, so you know, you weren't able to make it to our book launch party, but we're bringing the party to you today. <laughs> and so <laughs> there you go. Uh, the other thing I like to, to say about my family is, uh, as I mentioned now, we are an Afro-Colombian family. Afro-Colombian. Now, this is very important that you understand because Disney made a movie about an Afro-Colombian family in Kanto. And y'all, I'm just going to tell you how excited we were when this movie came out because we had never seen a family looking just like ours on the big screen. And I tell people, we are probably the closest you're going to come to meeting the family Madrigal. <laughs> we just are. I mean, we are, we're also a little bit quirky. We're a little bit magical because of Jesus. <laughs> and we also don't talk about Bruno. Now, what we do talk a lot about in my family is discipleship, as you might expect, with Mama being a National Discipleship Director. And I just want to say, I absolutely love all things related to discipleship and disciple making, okay? So um, reading the Bible, you know, learning how to study it, uh, sharing the gospel, um, prayer, you know, how, what does it look like to, to pray and to pray more deeply? Things like retreats, spiritual direction, all of these are my jam. They all have to do with what you think about when you think discipleship. What does discipleship have to do with, right? However, in 2020, new questions really began to nag at my soul, you know, as we were going through this profound racial reckoning, I began to ask some new questions. And mostly they were questions about relevance. Like what does all of this discipleship stuff have to do with the moment that we are in and the racial challenges that we are facing? What's the connection, <laughs> right? And then furthermore, how is it that our racial challenges have continued to, to go on um, and, and to even grow in some cases in areas where there are so many so-called Christian disciples. What's going on, right? And I really began to ask questions about the gap between discipleship and race that we typically have. For too long, we have put discipleship and race in like different lanes, you know, different categories. And even in the covenant, in the, in the covenant church, uh, the way that we have organized our departments has reflected that. And so my team is the make and deepen disciples team. And we do all those traditional things I said before. And then there's another team that does justice. It's a separate lane, <laughs> right? And they are the ones that talk about race and help people out with that, right? By the way, we're reorganizing right now, and that's going to change, just FYI. But, but even in our structure, that has been something, you know, they're not connected. What's the overlap? It's like if you're interested in race, you go talk to the justice people. 
But if you're interested in Jesus, talk to the discipleship people. Right? If you pick up a classic Discipleship 101 textbook and you, you, you most likely uh, won't find a chapter on race, and I mean like in the last generation, right? It just wouldn't be there. Just kind of not, not there. Or, you know, a little mention maybe about the Great Commission or about um, unity or something, right? But, but not really directly engaging racial challenges. So the result is that many Jesus followers today are confused or um, ineffective when it comes to confronting our racial challenges. Okay. So here is what the Lord has really raised up in my heart, that if we want to dismantle racism in our time, if we want to be part of the solution, right, rather than perpetuate the same problems, then we can't keep doing discipleship the same way we've been doing it, okay? If we want to dismantle racism, I think as Christians, the first step is that we've got to connect discipleship and race together. And they are connected in the scriptures, okay? So that is something that we need to return to, essentially. Now, I also think that in order to become effective, it's very helpful to understand the moment that we are in, like right now, what is going on around us, right? So that we can see God more clearly and how God is at work and have some sense of what we can do to be a part of the solution. So when I take a big picture look at race and discipleship in this country, I see three primary movements, and we may be in the midst of another historic shift right now, okay? So to take a look at that history, we're going to talk about the ABCs of racial discipleship. Can you say that with me? A, B, C. That is what we're going to cover today. So when we look, we can see in the beginning, in American discipleship, what we see is a kind of color a verse approach to discipleship that often baked right into discipleship teaching and practices was this concept that difference actually was not good, that it was good to be separated or even to oppress difference, okay? And then we see a move to color blind discipleship, especially after the, po the civil rights movement of the 60s, right? And then following that, my hope is that in more and more places, we will see something that looks like color courageous discipleship. Okay, so that is the journey that we're going to be on today, starting with color a verse. So, uh, again, people in early American history, and for much of our history, frankly, were often discipled, whether intentionally or unintentionally, to sort of be antagonistic toward other races. So I'll give some examples. In the 19th century, pro-slavery Bible teachers developed a distortion of discipleship that allowed them to justify hundreds of years of slavery. Okay, so, so if you're calling yourself a follower of Jesus and you're engaging in something like slavery, obviously something has to be distorted <laughs> about your approach to discipleship, and that is what we see. So there's a great article in Christian History Magazine. Why did so many Christians support slavery? I found this to be kind of just very eye-opening because we look back now and we're like, well, of course slavery was wrong. You know, that's not something that Christians should do. But for hundreds of years, they had an exegesis, a biblical understanding. They discipled around this concept. So here are some of the teachings commonly promoted in discipleship during this time. Abraham, the father of faith, and all the patriarchs held slaves without God's disapproval. Canaan, Ham's son, was made a slave to his brothers. And then, of course, the link was that black people are descendants of Canaan. Not the case, but that's, that's the link that was made. The Ten Commandments mention slavery twice, showing God's implicit acceptance of it. I actually had to look at that again. It, it does. Uh, in the long description of the Ten Commandments, slavery is mentioned twice. 
Slavery was widespread throughout the Roman world, and yet Jesus never spoke of it. So here you see the argument from silence, right? The apostle Paul specifically commanded slaves to obey their masters. And then once more, Paul returned a runaway slave Philemon to his master. So all you need to do is overemphasize these, take these out of context, and it can help to develop a kind of distortion of discipleship. You know, lest you think that these um, are like way in the past and no longer have an impact. So uh, essentially, someone on, someone on my own team, we were talking about uh, reading my book together, and she actually said, hey, you know, this is unbelievable, but um, even in my own family, I've, I've still heard some of these reasons given. Uh, she's got her family background is from the South. And she was saying, I remember my grandfather mentioning one time, you know, black people continue to have struggles because of the curse of Canaan. Like, this is in her lifetime. She learned that, right? And is being discipled in that way. The next picture is um, a picture from the Museum of the Bible in Washington, D.C. Anybody been there before? Museum of the Bible? Such a cool place. It, it helps to uh, illustrate many aspects of the Bible and its impact on us and on culture and how people have used or abused the Bible, okay? So this is an example of the latter. This is a picture of the slave Bible, slave Bible. So normally slaves were not permitted to read. They weren't permitted to learn to do that. But if and when they were, what they would be given as part of their discipleship was this, the slave Bible. And so what you'll see here in the little print that's too small for you to read, it says, parts from the Holy Bible selected for Negro slaves. And so whole sections of the Bible were missing here, uh, especially anything that could get them confused uh, about like equality, <laughs> okay? And yet that includes the entire book of Exodus. The entire book of Exodus is just not in the Bible. They couldn't figure out what to do with that one. So I think what that demonstrates is that in a color averse approach to discipling, um, what you see is a very selective kind of reading of the Bible. And even though the, the slave owners may have had the whole Bible, clearly they emphasize certain parts over other parts, right? Now we move forward many years to the 20th century where we still have a strange mix of discipleship and racism. Okay, so uh, got some very disturbing pictures here of Christian communities. And this was uh, mid, mid 20th century, especially when segregation began to be dismantled in our country and new laws were established around that, there was massive resistance, especially from some Christian quarters. And so new discipleship resources were developed around uh, segregation and helping to disciple people around that, to understand that segregation is the will of God. And so these quotes here are from a children's discipleship resource, okay, produced by the Citizens Council. And teachings like, the Bible teaches you to keep the races pure. In Acts 17, 26, you can read God's plan about the races. It says God separated the races by putting them in different parts of the world. And segregation is Christian. Okay. So remember, we're in color A verse discipleship right now. And uh, I just gave you a couple examples of what that looked like in big pockets of the church for many, many, many years, uh, even as late as the 1950s and 60s. Frankly, it would be depressing to give any more examples, so we're going to move on. But hopefully you can see what that was all about. Now... <clears throat> The next move that happened was the move from color a verse to color blind. Color a verse to color blind. And so this became very prominent after the civil rights movement of the 60s. Because essentially what happened was, you know, we came to a tipping point 
people began to realize, okay, this like outright bigotry, this, this isn't gonna work anymore. And you know, clearly there's a problem, we need to move on to something else. And that something else, largely, both uh, inside and outside of the church, is something called colorblindness. So we're going to explore that today. And you know, largely, I feel that I have been part of the colorblind generation. I was a generation raised immediately after the civil rights uh, movement, and so I relate probably most deeply to this. Before I do that, let me say one word uh, about, about this word blindness, because we know that there are people among us who experience literal visual impairments or potentially blindness. And what I want to be crystal clear about is that that's not what I'm talking about, <laughs> okay? Uh, people who are experiencing visual impairments are certainly not less in the kingdom of God. Um, the church, that's a whole separate sermon. The church has typically also not treated people with disability um, in the right way, and that is something to lament. I wanna show you briefly the artwork that hangs above my desk in my office. It's a depiction of Luke 14 by Hyatt Moore and really is what the church should look like. It's a picture of uh, the banquet of Jesus, which says, go out quickly into the streets and alleys of the town and bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame, right? Because uh, many people were refusing the banquet, and so more and more people were invited, and this is the kind of community that Jesus looks for. The kingdom of God is a table big enough to include everyone, can and should, people of all ages and ethnicities and abilities. Okay, so just a, just a little word about actual literal blindness, which is not what we're talking about today, but this metaphor of figurative color blindness is something our, our culture has been experiencing, so let's dive into that. Now, again, as I said, after the civil rights movement, there was uh, this emphasis on solving our problems with race by downplaying race, right? Essentially by saying, okay, if we wanna treat everybody equally, what we've gotta do, essentially, is close our eyes to what may be different about them. And in this way, the goal of colorblindness, frankly, has always been a good goal, right? This is a, this is a well-intentioned approach to people and the world. The goal has always been equality. And so as I say, um, that's great. And one of the favorite quotes of a colorblind approach is Martin Luther King. Now, he said a lot of things, my friends, brothers and sisters, but this quote is the most famous. I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but the content of their character. Okay, amen. Every word there, right? If you were to ask the average person on the street, what, can you tell me something he said? Probably that quote <laughs> that they will quote. <laughs> um, but I would argue that King was not colorblind, but color courageous because he said a lot of other things about noticing difference so that we can deal with any disparity that might exist. Now, what's the problem with colorblindness? You know, I, I would say it's connected to this. Colorblind discipleship is mostly known for what it does not do, what it doesn't do. So colorblind disciples don't see race. They don't differentiate. They don't intentionally discriminate. They don't, they don't, they don't. Um, but, but come to think of it then, colorblind disciples or people don't tend to talk about race or engage much around it at all. Because why should you if it doesn't matter <laughs> anymore? If, if, if even noticing it is what the problem is, then we better not notice it or talk about it, right? And when you do, it's a problem. So that starts to get, I think, at the weakness or the limitation, the limitation of colorblindness. There is some good to it, my friends, because we do need to see everyone equally in certain ways. We are all equally created in the image of God, right? We are all equally deserving of dignity. Yes. So in that way, 
thumbs up. But it's also limited, because if we're not also noticing what is different, we may be inclined to miss important realities. You know, um, in our day, one thing that's unique about this moment is that colorblindness is showing its limitations, proving, in fact, to be ineffective. In this course of the research I've done, um, what we've seen is that there's been so many studies done on the impact of colorblindness. There are actually people that like study these things. <laughs> and what we know from all of the research is that colorblindness, listen to this, this blew my mind, colorblindness actually produces more racial inequality. Precisely the opposite of what was intended. Now, this is a quote from The Psychology of Racial Colorblindness, a critical review, and Philip Mazzocco just summarized, the, the whole purpose of the book is to summarize all of the research on colorblindness. He says, although the preference for colorblindness may be well-intentioned for some, the consequences of colorblindness appear to be almost entirely negative both with respect to racial minorities and society at large. Wow. <laughs> and you know, there are more and more resources all the time that are coming at this from different angles. Just a few examples so that you're aware. Colorblind Racism by Megan Burke. Racism Without Racists. Colorblind Racism and the Persistence of Racial Inequality in America. And Seeing Race Again, Countering Colorblindness Across the Disciplines. Just fascinating. You know, so if I had to summarize, summarize, why doesn't colorblindness work? Why isn't it working anymore, getting us beyond the challenges that we face? Because if you can't see race, you also can't see racism. If you are not able to see the differences among people, then you are more likely to see the disparities that may exist with those differences. You're just likely to miss it because <laughs> you're not paying attention, right? And so the irony of this generation is that today, thankfully, few people consciously, intentionally embrace racism. And yet, if it's an area of life that can be measured, we are still having persistent inequalities in those areas, so many different areas. And we'll talk more about that. So, what we're gonna do today in terms of our scripture, we are going to take a look at a time where Jesus dealt with blindness. As we know, he did that on many occasions. Let's take a look at one example from the book of Mark. From the book of Mark. They came to Bethsaida, and some people brought a blind man and begged Jesus to touch him. He took the blind man by the hand and led him outside the village. When he had spit on the man's eyes and put his hands on him, Jesus asked, do you see anything? He looked up and said, I see people. They are walking around like trees. Once more, Jesus put his hands on the man's eyes. Then his eyes were opened, his sight was restored, and he saw everything clearly. This is the word of the Lord. So as we consider this strange story, <laughs> of Jesus healing a blind man, I want us to consider a couple of things. First, Jesus never solved any problems with blindness. Think about that. He met a challenge of some kind in society. He did not solve it with causing people to see less. <laughs> in Jesus' eyes, seeing more is always a good thing. Second, something that stands out to me about this passage is that this is a miracle in which Jesus heals in stages. That's also very interesting to me. A and I wonder if sometimes Jesus may also look to areas where we are experiencing blindness and 
we may experience healing in stages. Right? So when we think about, again, colorblindness today and that, that uh, philosophy, it is absolutely an upgrade from color averse discipleship, I would say. I would take a colorblind person any day over an outright bigot, wouldn't you? It's progress. It's progress. But I think what's going on in this moment is that more and more people are just are realizing, okay, but it's kind of like there's still more progress, right? So, so yes, people are, like maybe we're seeing people like trees walking around <laughs> kind of situation. Um, but we need to see more clearly. More clearly. Now, in the course of these works that I've written, I tell a little bit about my own story. And here's the thing. I myself have had to make a massive move, a shift from colorblind to color courageous. Me, personally. The complicated thing about our time as well is that just because I am a person of color doesn't mean that I necessarily get it or even have the experiences that other people of color have had. Let me flesh this out for you a little bit. So when I was growing up, my idol, like a woman that I just looked up to so much, was Claire Huxtable from The Cosby Show, y'all. So Claire Huxtable, <laughs> what can I say? So. She is a, uh, a lawyer, you know, an incredible professional. She is married to a doctor. Um, they have five beautiful children and a townhouse in Brooklyn. And her hair and makeup are always perfect. Okay. I would watch this Thursday nights at 8 Eastern time and think, I am going to be Claire Huxtable. This is my goal. And looking back now, people would kind of point to this uh, show as sort of the ultimate kind of colorblind show, you know, in a sense. Because, look, you know, um, this is a black family that has made it. They're not talking about race all the time. The solution, you know, we just, everybody needs to just try hard and, and that, that's it. Just take care of your family, try hard, and you'll be fine, right? And in a large way, that's, that's how I was raised as well. Just do your best. Try your hardest. And frankly, um, if, you, if you are okay, don't worry about everybody else. Okay. I was born in the South Bronx. I was born in the South Bronx, which is also where my parents were raised. A very uh, under-resourced area. Predominantly people of color. I didn't really know this until later, but because my parents were able to take advantage soon after their marriage of some kind of like low income housing program. It was a special program that they were able to sign up for and that allowed them to buy a house. And there were certain areas that they were building these homes and one of them was like the eastern reaches of Long Island, which was like an alien place for them <laughs> coming from the South Bronx. But through that program, they were able to move out to Long Island a predominantly white area, very well resourced, okay? And so I got to go to incredible public schools. Uh, I got to be able to assimilate to a predominantly white culture, learn how to talk right and do all the things, you know, so that I could be acceptable. And that, that was a, a real privilege that I got in my life completely different from them, right? And for the most part, I didn't, they didn't call attention to that. It was like, you are doing great. <laughs> you, know, you just keep fitting in. You keep getting those good grades. You become Claire Huxtable. All right. In our day, there are many, many people of color who break through and who make it for a wide variety of reasons. That's another reason why things are confusing. Like, did you know that we had a black president twice, and nobody killed him. 
I'm still amazed at that, right? Like, how is it possible, right, that, that we still have racial reckoning challenges in a world where we also have the possibility of a black person reaching the highest possible place? So it's confusing, right? It feels confusing. I saw this picture online. They call it the Black Mount Rushmore. <laughs> And you know, yeah, we still have, we have got luminaries these days who reach the stratosphere. And I love how Oprah's in the front, by the way. That's amazing. That's amazing. But here's what the Lord has helped me to see, to understand. That we have today many exceptions to the rule. Many exceptions to the rule, but there's still a rule. And sometimes even people like me I need my eyes open to that fact. Because for years, I just didn't, I didn't understand it. Uh, you, may have, you may have heard how Bill Cosby, one of the things that he was famous for for a while was like, like chastising his own people, like chastising black people, like, hey, you know, work harder, be like me. What's wrong with you, right? So again, that kind of, that kind of um, approach or attitude can even be found among people of color. The Lord brought me on a journey to move from colorblind to color courageous, and I believe he's doing something very similar today on a large scale with many, many people, and people from every ethnic background, from every ethnic group. So, I talked before about knowing the moment that we're in. The scripture from First Chronicles is particularly poignant there. It says, the tribe of Issachar supplied 200 leaders along with all their relatives under their command. They kept up to date in their understanding of the times and knew what Israel should do. And I would say the same, that for disciples to be effective and to love courageously, we have to understand the moment that we're in. If we consider the contrast between the 60s and now, for example, this next slide will show that, right? Both, in both generations, we've seen protests, but the moments were very different. Mostly what was being protested in the 60s was a kind of color-averse approach to things, right? Blatant racism baked into the laws, you know, um, racial violence by, you know, authorities that was legitimate and okay. Like all of that, just an averse approach, right? Antagonistic approach to racism. Thank God a lot of that has been dismantled, right? But today, there's still these protests. And why? Mostly, I think, people are saying, we've made some progress, but we still have far to go. This colorblind thing is not working. We're still experiencing mass massive inequality and all kinds of problems related to race. We need to open our eyes more so we can see what that looks like and figure out how we can get involved. Today, we have racism without racists. It is the irony of our time. The irony of our time. And colorblindness, I think, is a key explanation. I want to point something out as well with that picture I just put up of the contrast. So the New York Times reported in the summer of 2020, it's estimated 15 to 26 million people participated in racial justice demonstrations. If those estimates are correct, then the protests that were happening after the murder of George Floyd were the largest protests in US history. They far surpassed the protests of the civil rights movement. Isn't that crazy? If I had to guess what were the largest protests, I'd think, oh, you know, the times of Martin Luther King, et cetera. No, <laughs> our generation. More people of more backgrounds and more places in the United States protested than ever before around race or any top, any subject, ever. So again, this is a moment, right? And I think we, we need to, as disciples, be aware and have some sense of how we can be engaged. This next slide is, uh, was lent to me by Michael Emerson. He's the author of Divided by Faith. And 
well, divided by faith, which is a, a classic in the area of race and disparity in the church and outside. So what he does here, there are 39 different areas where he collected research that shows persistent racial inequality, measurable inequality in our country, right? And so you could ask him, hey, you know, give me all the research for number six or whatever, and he could provide that. And he just stopped at 39 because he didn't have more room on the slide. <laughs> okay. But it's ongoing. In my book, I talk a lot about it and what it looks like with concrete you know, resources for you to explore to show what racial inequality looks like today because it's different. It's different than it used to. Okay. So it's time to move on to something else. And that is what I like to call color courageous. So I think we are in the midst of another historic disciples, discipleship shift where more and more people are realizing the colorblind thing isn't working as well as we would hope. It's not getting us to where we need to go now. And so what do I mean by color courageous? I define this as the courageous choice to see, <laughs> to see race, to see our differences in order to foster biblical racial equity and to build beloved community. So it's seeing both what makes us the same and also what makes us different. This by itself is a huge move, especially when the purpose is to build beloved community. Beloved community. Okay, let's talk about Martin Luther King again because this is his phrase, beloved community. And as I said before, that famous quote, a lot of people know it. He said other things. If you were to ask people what was Martin Luther King's dream, actually, he probably would not have said this. So I had a chance to visit the King Center in Atlanta. Beautiful place. I highly recommend it. You can see the Nobel Prize that he won. You could visit the church that he preached in, the home that he was literally birthed into. And you can visit his tomb. He and Coretta are both buried there. And right across from the tomb, there is something called the eternal flame. The eternal flame. And it represents his dream. It represents his dream. That we hope will never die, right? So again, if you were to interview, if you were to ask random people on the street, what was King's dream? They'd say a lot of different things. Oh, racial equality. Uh, political rights, um, th that quote from before, you know, <laughs> that we would not judge people in the color of their skin, right? That is not actually the right answer. So the King Center, a huge part of their current, um, their current work is to promote King's actual dream, which was beloved community. And on the plaque right next to that flame, they make it clear. It says, the eternal flame symbolizes the continuing effort to realize Dr. King's ideals for beloved community. And what we know is that beloved community was a deeply biblical dream. It was based on the greatest commandment of our Savior, Jesus Christ, which is to love God and one another. Essentially, beloved community is a diverse community, a community full of differences, but also committed to loving and sacrificing for one another as Jesus did for us. You probably won't hear as much about beloved community these days uh, because it's so Jesus-y, right? And, and now King is a very secular kind of icon. But King was clear. Here's a quote from him. I do not think of political power as an end. Neither do I think of economic power as an end. They are the ingredients in the objective that we seek in life, the creation of the beloved community. And I wish more people knew that quote. I define beloved community as a diverse community committed to sacrificing for one another and loving one another with the very love of God. Martin Luther King wasn't colorblind, but color courageous for the sake of building this kind of beloved community. 
in all three of my works, um, the end goal is to build beloved community. That is the end goal. Nothing else. I, I mean, everything else is important, <laughs> right? Rights and equality and justice and all the things. But at the end of the day, all of these are ingredients to help people encounter God and to love one another as God intended. And we need to start that early, which is also why I have a children's book. You remember that children's discipleship resource I put up earlier, right? We got to start early in helping our children understand what is beloved community and how can we build it. So we've been talking about the ABCs, color averse to color blind to color courageous, right? And it really makes me think of Jesus' eyes on this blind man's, uh, Jesus' hands on his eyes, and just thinking about the fact that, yes, we have come to see more, but it's like we see trees walking around. It's time for us to see even more clearly. I love that beautiful language, that the man finally saw everything clearly. This is one of the quotes from the book. In a traumatized world, healing, discipleship, and mission are all intimately intertwined. There's so many ways that we need healing if we are to be effective in our world as disciples and disciple makers. Final thing I want to share. Also had an opportunity to visit the National Museum of African American History and Culture a separate visit to DC, also highly recommended. And one of the interesting things about this museum is that you start out in the basement, like you go way down, and you go back in time, okay? And so you begin uh, on, in the continent of Africa and in the bowels of a slave ship, and you experience what that must have been like. And then every floor you go up, you go up, and as you go up, you are going further in time, right, um, to the present day, to understand the challenges of that generation. And uh, every floor had a quote, one quote, one quote that was chosen to illustrate the main racial challenge of that generation. Okay, so I was very curious for our time, our moment, what was the quote that they would choose, right? This is it. If the problem of the 20th century was, in W.E.B. Du Bois' famous words, the problem of the color line, then the problem of the 21st century is the problem of color blindness, the refusal to acknowledge the causes and consequences of enduring racial stratification. Fascinating. That's the one quote they chose for the challenge of our time. So the question is, how can we, as disciples of Christ, be involved in the move from color blind to color courageous. It begins with asking Jesus to heal us of our blindness any ways that we need to be healed, regardless of our racial background, right, as I talked about before. <sighs> Ultimately, this is a supernatural work. I really believe that. We're, the battle is not against flesh and blood, but powers and principalities the, the monster of racism continues to exist and to just morph into different forms. And it's a, a, an evil, you know, that, that I know that the enemy rejoices in. So our task is to seek our Lord Jesus, to be filled with his grace and his power and his love so that we can be healed and set free to heal others. Let's pray.